Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. China's moves to support its ailing economy and markets continue with its banks slashing benchmark lending rates by more than investors and economists were expecting. They're taking cues from officials who've implemented a host of measures to revive growth and put a floor under the housing market. The PBOC has already signaled that more easing is on the cards, including lowering the reserve requirement ratio. Now, just over a month ago, going short Chinese stocks was one of the world's most popular trades. Fast forward to now, bullish China is one of the most crowded positions after Beijing's stimulus blitz stoked a short-lived rally. Well, our next guest became famous back in 2011, shorting Chinese companies at a time when they were the Wall Street darlings. Joining us exclusively now, Muddy Waters founder, Carson Block, sometimes called the king of short selling. Carson, good to have you with us. It seems like China is a great spot to start because you started short selling Chinese companies back in 2011, the likes of uh, uh, Sino Forest, Ai Chi Yi, uh, Luckin Coffee, and you're still not liking China, even though we've seen a slew of measures, policy changes, and efforts to perhaps, uh, you know, uh, have more transparency. Why is that? Sure. Well, I come at China mostly from the U.S. listed China stock perspective and to a lesser extent Hong Kong. But the thing, the reasons why I have been calling China uninvestable in terms of the equities since 2010 have to do with governance. And so particularly for the non-mainland listed equities, Governance was always a problem because it was, especially for U.S. listed ADRs, for people who, in China, managers who wanted to commit fraud, it was a heads I win, tails I don't lose proposition because the U.S. has never actually materially disciplined um, a c- confirmed um, fraudster from China. So you had that issue of governance. But then you overlay the capriciousness of China's policy. And we began really seeing this around 2018, 2019, when China began just turning dials and all of a sudden deciding that it was going to zero effectively for some period of time, the for-profit education industry. And then Didi Chuxing, which was about to go public, and um, Alibaba's uh, and, you know, and Financial. So you now have this, so you have that capriciousness of policy, and that has gotten worse. Um, but the the other thing that foreign investors in particular didn't understand or took them a long time to understand is that I mean, China doesn't view itself, at least at the policymaking level, as on a long-term basis needing foreign capital. So every now and then they'll say the right things, and there's history of this, they'll attract foreign capital and then they'll help incinerate it. So on top of the governance risks, the capriciousness of policy risks, you also now have the geopolitical risks. Um, she has been pretty clear at times that, and what, something that I thought was never actually on the table a few years ago, uh, that China might mm. try to take Taiwan by force, that is, I think, on the table. So there were Previously, again, just for governance reasons, if you own these stocks and you're in the U.S., you could wake up one morning and, you know, one of the companies is a zero. Then with capriciousness of government policy, you know, several of your stocks, you could wake up and find them to be zeros. But now with the geopolitical risk, all of the China equities you own, you could wake up one day and they're zeros because war has started. So from a medium to long term perspective, I once again just still fail to see how having money committed to China makes sense. Now, on a short-term basis, I don't have an opinion. So if you're long China because you get that it's a trade, okay, great. Like, you know, reasonable people can disagree on that. I'm not going to argue with that. But if you're thinking of marrying this, that's a path that a lot of people have been burned by before. And I wouldn't think that this time would be different. 
So Carson, China is a trade. It is not an investment. I just want to put it out there as well. China does need foreign capital right now. And when it comes to transparency, accountability, governance, it is really trying to address that. We've seen a lot of reforms, yet you say it has not done enough. Uh, Would you say it is in the right direction? Well, okay, from a very long-term perspective, there are two things that um, I think she has done at a very high level correctly. Um, so number one, the, the the fixed asset bubble, I mean, it was no secret for you know, like over 20 years that there's a massive fixed asset bubble. And every now and then, uh, policymakers, you know, particularly under the cool when regime, they would talk about how they need to rebalance the economy. And they would start to do that. They would tighten up on lending to property and other consumers or other deployers of capital into fixed assets. And then they would look at the data, the lights flashed red, they stared into the abyss and they lost their nerve and the taps were open again and the bubble continued to inflate. So she, probably because he's been able to perfect population control measures during COVID, has felt that he has the ability to really tighten the screws and prick that bubble in a way that he previously didn't and and the government before he became uh, chairman did not feel. So from a long-term perspective, that's good. That's necessary to reset the balance in China's economy. The other thing that he's done that's smart is his focus, or he's had the, the focus on technology go away from that traditional, you know, consumer-led technology, SaaS, uh, you know, online, et cetera, into real hardcore industrial technologies. So from a strategic perspective for China, that's beneficial. Um, but, you know, in terms of, yes, China wants foreign capital right now, but the moment that she feels that doesn't need it or that the, the costs of it outweigh the benefits, uh, foreigners are going to be horribly abused again. It's this right. movie plays repeatedly. So what would it take for you to change your mind? What would it take for China to be investable? Well, uh, you know, look, I'm, I'm obviously <laughs> never the person. Are, are you just not to. liking China at all? No, 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 no matter what China does, you're not going to like it. I mean, is that a fair assumption to make? Is that the real picture when it comes to Kassen Block and China? Well, I've always considered that the, the domestic equities were different from a governance perspective than the offshore equities, particularly the U.S. equities. There was always more recourse. The heads I win, tails I don't lose equation doesn't necessarily exist with domestic onshore equities. So, um, that, And that's something that we haven't looked at before. But if you're looking at buying Chinese equities in the U.S., um, that governance risk is always there. I don't believe the numbers. I do trust the numbers or much more likely to trust the numbers onshore. But at the end of the day, Mm. China, in contrast to, say, Vietnam, which we are very constructive on, um, doesn't feel like it really needs foreign capital. And I don't think it's it intends to be accommodating the foreign capital on a long term basis. Okay, let's talk about the U.S. Uh, Overvalued. Some say we've seen, what, 47 straight sessions of record and the most expensive in decades. Um, Is that something to be concerned about? Well, there's a debate as to what really drives when you talk about the U.S. market, especially the S&P 500 or the MAG 7. Um, I'm in the camp that although I haven't, I don't have the, the facility with math to really try to prove this out, but I'm in the camp that believes that what drives that index are flows. And so at the end of every month, U.S. US workers, you know, a lot of them, their paychecks go into their 401ks, which are retirement funds, and there's a robo bid for these stocks. And what happens is you reduce the effective supply of stock because you're taking out the active owners of stocks that will decide, hey, at this price, I'm a seller. At a lower price, I'm a buyer. And you're replacing that with a holder that will never sell unless and until it has outflows because people are drawing down the retirement accounts. So 
according to that view, as long as the labor market is reasonably strong in the U.S., which it is, you're not going to see outflows. You're just going to continue to see inflows, especially in those, you know, in the the most heavily weighted names in the uh, in the S and P 500. So, I have in the past few years, I have looked back on my career as an activist short seller, and you know, kind of done the math and felt like, well, you know. I probably could have just been levered long the S&P 500, deferred my taxes and uh, gone through a lot less BS, you know, and, and be in more or less the same <laughs> position financially. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, that that does make the market more fragile, but there's a Fed put. Right. There's always a Fed put. You know, is there does there come a point in time when the system breaks and the Fed can't fix it? Theoretically, yes. In in our lifetimes, I don't know. Uh, so I think for now, it probably just pays not to think too much. Just close your eyes and buy. Um, you know, probably hey. Mag Seven. Uh- Carson, speaking of Max 7, let's speak about NVIDIA. I mean, that's what's driving that sentiment and that uh, rally that we've seen. $3 trillion market cap, we're talking about PE of 63. It's driving a lot of the other companies up as well. Are there companies which are unduly benefiting from that run we're seeing because of NVIDIA? Point them out well, for, for us. <laughs> so, not ready to do that. You know, when we point them out, there's usually a full report behind that because, you know, but we need that in case we get sued, um, which does happen quite a bit. But um, in every in every hype cycle and AI is obviously the hype cycle in every hype cycle, you get opportunists who have companies that are maybe semi real, maybe not even that real, but they decide to take advantage of it because there's so much money chasing that. So, yes. There will continue to be more. I mean, previously it was crypto and there were, you know, there were a number of companies that were really dodgy in the crypto crypto mining space or crypto adjacent spaces. So, I mean, and even the full on crypto companies are probably pretty dodgy uh, to begin with. But, yeah, there will be a lot of people who take advantage of the AI hype cycle. Um, you can make money as a trader there as long as you're in on the joke and you're not left holding the bag. But there will be painful bag holding uh, eventually. So there is a bubble waiting to burst. And if so, how soon do you think that might happen? Well, I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bubble. Like, I, I don't opine on NVIDIA. Um, I've got two, two friends, each very smart, highly accomplished, and they've got a bet about whether NVIDIA is going to be down by 50 percent in the next, you know, I guess another nine months or so. They each make compelling arguments. I don't have a view, but I do know that there will be a lot of pretenders in the space looking to vacuum up the dollars that are being thrown into the space. And those are the ones that we will consider shorting. If you're not opining over NVIDIA, are you opining of a Tesla? We've seen how, you know, Elon Musk has unveiled his robo-taxi much anticipated, but lacking on details. Big plans, of course, that humanoid robot as well, that robo-van, lots of plans, but lacking details. Uh, investors obviously not liking. We've seen how the stock has, uh, you know, has taken a tumble. What's your take on Tesla? Well, yeah, I make everybody mad when I talk about Tesla, the bulls and the bears, because <laughs> uh, number one, nobody, probably nobody has ever played the public company game better than Elon Musk. And um, several years ago, I, the only letter I've ever written to investors, um, I had this epiphany about Tesla and Elon Musk. And, you know, there is in life probably a need for a certain amount of gilding the lily. When it works, we call it chutzpah, and we applaud. Now, when it's too much, it doesn't work, then the person's Trevor Milton, and you know he's derided and occasionally prosecuted. Elon has this perfect balance between BSing and delivering, okay? I mean, the cars drive, the rockets fly, um, the satellites work. He does these incredible things. Does he routinely overpromise? 
I mean, say things that it's hard to imagine he can say with a straight face. Yes, he does. But does that matter? Apparently not. Um, so, yeah, nobody's played the game better than he has. It's, it is a volatile stock. Um, but, you know, it continues to get flows, going back to what I said earlier, um, and mm. will continue to get flows. And I think what was really – what everybody on the bear side missed about it, you know, the arguments were, oh, Tesla doesn't have the scale. It can't compete with Toyota, Volkswagen, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that's true. They didn't have the, the, the sales base scale or the manufacturing scale. But what all of the bears missed and was what my epiphany really was in 21 was that Elon understood that the base – that he, the scale he needed to have was capital base. And so when he was able mm. to yoke that stock price way up and have this enormous market cap, I mean, even, you know, even if uh, the company is bleeding billions of dollars and the stock is sinking, there's so much market cap that he continued, can continue to raise money and Tesla's not going bankrupt in the, you know, for a very long time. And that's what the bears missed because the bears were hung up on this. Oh, it bleeds money. It's going to go bankrupt. Um, right. And, and look, I was in that camp for a number of years, but, um, but no, he, Elon pulls rabbits out of the hat constantly. Like it's, it's one thing to bet on him or bet on Tesla, but I just, I just won't bet against Elon. Um, I did in a minor way several years ago. We had, long day mm. it crash puts on tesla uh that almost hit and paid off but no it's just you can't bet against the guy if you take a look at tesla stocks right carson i mean big loser this year but still trading at um, high multiples a pe of 61 the question really is whether tesla's fundamentals can support this kind of pricing for the stock your take on that well, I, my take is it doesn't matter. It's never mattered. And if you really scratch the surface on the earnings, I mean, a lot of that has to do with selling credits, you know, carbon credits. So from an and, and Tesla's accounting has always been heavily criticized by the bears and they're not wrong. And I'm, look, I'm not current on the accounting mm. or the numbers, just to be clear, but um, it doesn't matter. And when you look at I mean, it's amazing to look at the evolution of Elon Musk, right? He was once the darling of the political left in the U.S. He was seen as, you know, an environmentalist. And now he's the darling of the political right. And it hasn't mm -hmm. hurt. I mean, he's and, you know, and he was a lot of people now do compare him to to Trump. And I think there are I, I think in terms of personality, there are a lot of valid comparisons. But what's interesting is when Elon started his jihad against short sellers, especially Jim Chinos, probably back around 2015, 16, if I remember correctly, just like Trump himself, when Trump was running for president, Elon recognized the potential of a populist movement. So he made, he created this whole sort of market populist movement, the sentiment that, hey, by buying my stock, you are sticking it to these you know, powerful, shadowy short sellers. And Right. You know, back then, I, I didn't understand why he was so fixated on short sellers. And I thought it was just some, you know, thin skin or, you know, easily bruised ego. And that could be true. But I think it was really strategic that he understood that by setting up this plot of good versus, you know, purportedly evil, he could get people to buy the stock. And that is part of the reason why you don't bet against the guy and why nobody has played the game the public company game better than Elon Musk. The, the, the thing is, Carson, he's aligned himself so closely with Trump. Is there a risk to that? Yeah, people thought so back then. But, um, I, I, you know, I, I don't think so. I mean, it's uh, mm. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the guy, the guy's incredible. I mean, I don't say that as a fanboy, um, but it's. Now, I, I once thought I once thought that that would be a risk to the brand. But, you know, there I mean, America is pretty evenly split. The world is pretty evenly split. So, you know, if the, if the left isn't going to buy the cars, then the right's going to buy them. And if you went back to 2015 or 2016, you know, the right wouldn't scoff at the idea of electric cars. And now they love Elon Musk. And 
for them buying a you know a Tesla is a bit of a you know a symbol of supporting libertarianism or you know a right wing populism. So um, yeah, I, I don't think it matters for the brand. I just want to put it out there, though, that once upon a time you did say that Elon, uh, Elon Musk is a liar. Yeah, Well, he does lie. Yeah. I mean, that's I mean, I, I think I just said that, you know, a few minutes ago. Yes, he mm -hmm. does lie. But there's enough truth in what he does. Again, the rockets fly, the cars drive, um, you know, the satellites work, you know. So there's he's got this he has this perfect balance between lying and deception and delivering in truth, the perfect balance for this moment in time. Mm. A lot of eyes on the U.S. election. Does it matter who wins for the financial markets? Would, you know, a Trump administration be better for the stock market or would it uh, Kamala Harris? Well, I'm going to answer that with some nuance. Um, I think for if you're in the finance industry in America, Trump is definitely better for you. Does it matter to the markets? Again, going back to my view that the kind of on autopilot effectively, or at least, you know, the, the, the S&P 500 is because of, of flows um, and just excess liquidity. I mean, even with the Fed having raised rates, there's still so much liquidity in the system that you see, you know, I mean, to me, I'll, I'll never understand what the actual value of Bitcoin is, right? It's a currency without a country. Mm. And um, if there's any intrinsic value, it's well beyond, beyond that. So that just shows you there's still so much liquidity in the system. So I don't see Kamala winning, impacting that. Um, but definitely Trump makes finance somewhat less crappy to be in um, as an industry. Somewhat. Um, you can't really put the toothpaste back in the tube, given how far we've come in terms of onerous legislation, rules and regulation, but he, he'll make it somewhat less onerous. I want to touch on Vietnam. What's a short seller like you betting long on Vietnam? Alia, when you talked about how you're taking issue with China because of, uh, you know, uh, transparency, governance, uh, accountability, uh, the same issues do apply with Vietnam. Well, um, not I, I, I'll so I'll obviously take the other side of that. Um, I mean, look, with China, I, I've lived there twice. I've done about six years in country. Um, I was living there again from 05 to 10. And that's when I started Muddy Waters. And I, I studied started kind of by act. I mean, effectively by accident. But at the time I started it and realized that, my God, there's this whole world that has no idea you know, they throw all this money into China and they have no idea what's going on. Um, it was stunning to me that there was such an information disconnect and such a disconnect between perceptions of foreigners as to how business is done in China and what really goes on. And then in 2017, okay. I was going around saying, hey, you know, Trump has been he's, he became president. Um, and so many aspects of the U.S.-China bilateral relationship are underwater, but in the markets, that's not yet underwater. And everybody's really excited about Chinese stocks. But 2020, right. when COVID hit, that was a breaking point. And so I asked, I said to myself, this is going to be different. This is going to be the time when finally the West has a real serious break with China. And it's going to be the biggest geopolitical realignment since World War II. And it's all going to involve country's relationships to China. And so the winners in that in that world or in this world that we're in are the ones that are non-aligned. So India and Vietnam. And, you know, Vietnam is never going to be the U.S.'s ally, but it's definitely not going to be China's ally. Right. And so with Carson, FBI... Uh, time is... Quickly running out. I have to get this in. I want to take a look at the outlook for short uh, selling. You've said before how, you know, you feel like uh, a gun is pointed at short sellers and that your years as a short seller are pretty numbered. Uh, talk to us about where this is going and might it be the end for you soon in well, terms of okay. short selling? So that 
what you're referring to is actually, I think, uh, that was an article that uh, a couple of Bloomberg print journalists wrote uh, a couple of years ago. And we took issue with that because they spent an entire day with me. And I think they took that somewhat out of context. Um, look, really excited about our Vietnam Fund product. But that doesn't mean that I'm getting out of short selling. We're doing things and resources mostly on the long side. Doesn't mean I'm getting out of short selling. It's a difficult time for short selling, but um, yeah, right. I mean, I'm still coming to the office and, you know, long and strong Vietnam. Carson, Carson, we have to live with that. Thank you for joining us. Carson Block, Muddy Waters Capital founder and CIO. This is Bloomberg. Stay with us.